Well, let's take a moment now and see if we can't actually uh, get where the rubber hits the road and, and look at perhaps the study. And I probably should give you a little bit of background here because you're probably wondering what in the world is a general surgeon doing with an interest in cardiovascular disease? So I should share with you a bit of background. Uh, when I joined the Cleveland Clinic after coming back from Vietnam in 1969, I, in the late, by the mid and late 1970s, I was chairman of our breast cancer task force. And it was as chairman of the breast cancer task force that I became increasingly disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was absolutely doing nothing, nothing whatsoever for the next unsuspecting victim. And this led me to do a bit of a global study. And it was quite striking to find that there are other cultures on the planet where breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States, like for instance, Kenya. And it was, breast cancer was very infrequently seen in rural Japan in the 1950s. And yet as soon as the Japanese women moved to the United States by the second and third generation, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. And perhaps even more striking was when you looked at the entire nation of Japan. How many autopsy deaths were there in Japan and the entire nation due to prostate cancer in 1958? The total, 18. The most mind boggling public health figure I think I've ever encountered. And yet by 1978, 20 years later, the figure was still only 137 as they slowly westernized. But as soon as the Japanese men moved to the United States, now they have the same increased rates of prostate cancer as men in the United States. In this country this year, it's not 18 who will die from prostate cancer, it is 28,000, which is astounding when you think of how of strong a correlation there seems to be between nutrition and prostate cancer. Well, somewhere along the line of this uh, in global investigation that I was doing, I began to frequently encounter cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And it just seemed to me that there would be a greater, bigger bang for the buck if we could somehow get people in the United States to eat plant-based, they not only would save themselves from heart disease, but would be markedly diminish the likelihood of having the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and perhaps uh, pancreatic. So I came back to uh, round zero with the understanding that just because I had done this sort of global survey, uh, there was nothing, <laughs> you simply can't say, say to the United States public at large, hey, you guys, you better, you better eat plant-based and save yourself from heart disease. That doesn't quite fly. You've really got to do the, the research. So I, I knew I was going to do this study, but uh, when, in all honesty, I was a cholesterolholic. I had grown up on an Aberdeen Angus beef farm and a dairy farm, and I, lo I loved all those foods. And you probably know that by now, anytime you ask a patient or even asking yourself to make a significant lifestyle change, there are a sort of a number of steps you have to go through. You start with pre-contemplation, then you go to contemplation, then you go action, and then you go maintenance. So I was knowing I was going to do this, but I just didn't quite know when I was going to get started. And it happened uh, in April of 1984 was a seminal moment. Was, uh, I was with my wife, Anne, and we were together at a surgical meeting in New Haven, Connecticut. And sadly, the, the papers were rather dull. The, boy, the, the weather was rotten. But they always seemed to have a banquet 
uh, after these occasions. And at the banquet, a waitress put a plate in front of me and the roast beef was so enormous, it was draped over the sides of the plate. So as I shook my head, Anne looked at me and said, you're not gonna eat your roast beef? And I said, no. She said, well then I'll have it. Now, I should give you a bit of background. Anne's mother had died at age 52 of breast cancer. And two weeks after that uh, meeting in New Haven, Anne's sister came down with breast cancer. And she looked at me and said, I'm with you. So together in April of 1984, we became plant-based. And a year later, I uh, went to Bill Sheldon, who was the chairman of the Department of Cardiology and said I wanted to do a small study, but it had to be small because of my surgical obligations, which were still intact. And uh, if there could be 25 patients who were seriously ill with cardiovascular disease, I wanted them to try <clears throat> to uh, try to eat. <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> I wanted them to try to eat uh, plant-based. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> my concern was, how was I gonna get these people to comply? Because this was really the challenge. And I decided that for these patients, I would use the same mantra <clears throat> that I had, was using previously for my cancer patients. And it was something that I had learned years ago from a marvelous uh, <clears throat> West Coast surgeon by the name of Bert Dunphy. And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer and patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid uh, of being abandoned by their family or by their physician. So for the first five years of this study, I saw every patient in my office every two weeks we drew their cholesterol, checked their blood pressure, their weight, and I went over every morsel they ate with a diet diary. At the end of five years, I got a little bit more cor courageous and I stretched it out to once a month, recognizing that most cardiologists see their patients twice a year. Now, by the end of 10 years, they were really pretty well on, on autopilot, so I extended it out to see them quarterly. And then at 12 years, we wrote this study up and published, and uh, which I'm gonna sort of share with you now. It's the first of two studies that I was involved in with this. And uh, <clears throat> although there were 23 men and one woman, we had nothing against women. It was simply the way that patients were sent to me in the subsequent study, we had many more women. But the key was this. They were all seriously ill with triple vessel disease. I did not want them to eat a single morsel that would further injure their endothelial cells. So that meant for them to avoid any oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in the cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures endothelial cells as does anything with a mother or a face. That meant meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs were gone. Also, no dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. I didn't like sugary drinks uh, or Pepsi or Coke or sugary foods, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey, sugar, injures endothelial cells. I'd like them to avoid, I didn't have a problem with people who did not have cardiovascular disease having nuts, but my patients who, have, who had cardiovascular disease, I wanted them to avoid nuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, or avocado, and finally, avoid coffee with caffeine. Now, we're gonna tell you in a moment what they ate, but first, this is so that those of you who may be nervous about what I said uh, about oil, here is a, <laughs> here is a peer reviewed scientific study showing that olive, soybean, 
and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. Yeah. Now this actually is a bit of study from our institution by Stanley Hazen, who was looking specifically at the molecules of lecithin and carnitine, which are found in these animal products that are eaten by an omnivore. And what he looked at was that in an omnivore, it appears that in the gut bacteria, in the microbiome, there are bacteria which will metabolize these, mole these molecules of lecithin and carnitine into TMA, trimethylamine, which is rapidly oxidized in your liver to trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide appears to injure your blood vessels, which is a sort of very powerful statement of why <clears throat> uh, animal foods are injuring your blood vessels. Here is the uh, schematic of what we've uh, I've just mentioned, namely lecithin and carnitine, the animal molecules that are being metabolized by the omnivore's gut bacteria into TMAO, which gives vascular disease. But the striking thing, the striking thing that uh, was found by Stanley Hazen was that if he took somebody who was absolutely 100% total plant-based and gave them a lamb chop, measured their blood from TMO, none, not there, not there. So tremendous protection against vascular disease by avoiding the injury from TMO and TMO comes from eating animal products. Now, you probably wonder why I'm showing you, this is a, the single slide in this entire presentation that has nothing whatsoever to do with cardiovascular disease because it was such a, to me, it was such a supremely powerful moment in October of 2015, the World Health Organization. Now imagine this, the WHO membership from all over the world came together and agreed that red meat now had the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. All right, back to this trust study. What were these patients gonna eat? They were gonna eat whole grains for their cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, and all these marvelous red, yellow, green leafy vegetables, and white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and fruit. Now, one other thing that I think is important at this point to discuss, and that is what we've added in the, in the last decade for patients who do have cardiovascular disease. Hopefully by now, if I've made myself clear, you understand the importance of the endothelial cells and nitric oxide. Now, what is now understood is that the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age dependent. For example, when you look at boys and girls who are eight or nine years old, you never heard of them having a heart attack. Why? They have nitric oxide pouring out of their ears. But by the time you're age 50, even if you are beautifully healthy, your endothelial cells are now producing 50% of the nitric oxide that you had when you were 25. By the time you're over 80, you've lost 70% of the nitric oxide production from endothelial cells. So since all these patients with heart disease are so deprived of nitric oxide, I should share with you how we did this uh, business of additionally adding six green leafy vegetables daily. Try to have the patients understand that if they could shrink their head to a size that they could crawl inside the coronary artery supplying their heart with blood, they would see that blockage as an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants, but no, 
do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's going to be harmful. I need you to get your antioxidants from food. Fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value, O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries on your morning oat cereal, terrific start. However, Nothing is going to trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need you to chew six times a day a green leafy vegetable, roughly half the size of your fist, after it has first been boiled in water or steamed five and a half to six minutes, so it's now nice and tender. And then I'd like to have you be sure to anoint it with several drops of either a rice or balsamic vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars will restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, which is contained within the endothelial cell and responsible for making nitric oxide. All right. Now, <clears throat> therefore, I want you to chew this green leafy vegetable alongside your breakfast, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of arugula or kale. Now, <clears throat> the second benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell. What do the endothelial progenitor cells do? They make and, and restore, that is they replace your senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. Now the third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, and this is most important of all, because this is your alternate pathway to make nitric oxide as your endothelial cells are not doing it as well as you would have liked. So the third benefit is as you are chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew the green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce that green nitrate that you are chewing to a green nitrite. Now, when you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce that nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So just think about it, how amazing. With no added expense, no hideous side effects, Literally, <clears throat> from morning to night, dawn to dusk, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now, there is a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, or mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And we do not like patients to take antacids because antacids, antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will not be able to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Now, you're probably wondering what are those green leafy vegetables that Dr. Esselstyn is talking about? They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top six are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. Pretty, uh, pretty darn exciting stuff. <clears throat> 